Yeah, and welcome everyone. My name is Shalan Jasani, and I'll be moderating today's Fields of the Future speaker series, exploring data visualization. A little bit about me, I'm finishing up my third year of computer engineering here at the University of Texas at Austin, and I'm a board member of the Aga Khan Education Board for the Southwestern United States. The Fields of the Future speaker series is hosted by the Aga Khan Education Board with the aim of exploring career paths, innovation, and opportunities in selected fields of the future. As for today's edition, we will begin by reflecting on the Knowledge Society and the purpose of education in Islam. At this time, I'd like to invite Danish Tarani, our Fields of the Future team member, to share this reflection. All right. Thanks, Jono. So, you to everyone. Uh, welcome to the fifth episode of Fields of the Future series. My name is Danish, and I serve as one of the team members for the Fields of the Future of the Aga Khan Education Board for the United States. Uh, before we begin the event, I would like to refresh the Jamaat's memory about Knowledge Society and the purpose of education in Islam. Aga Khan highlights the purpose of continued learning at Aga Khan Academy, Mozambique, on June 25, 2004, in which he said, In the Islamic tradition, they view the discovery of knowledge as a way to understand, so as to serve better God's creation, to apply knowledge and reason to build society and shape human aspirations. Aga Khan Academy, Maputo, Mozambique, June 25, 2004. How does understanding the purpose of knowledge discovery help us understand knowledge society? It tells us what the two critical attributes are of true knowledge society leaders. First, to discover new knowledge, which is related to the first purpose of understanding God's creation. And the second is to share and apply new knowledge, which is related to the second purpose of serving God's creation. How's your mom at the Aga Khan University convocation address on 6 December 2006 explains that these attributes will be the most will be the utmost importance in the future. And I quote, all of these changes suggest that we are moving into a new epoch of history, a new condition of human life. Many observers describe this new world as a knowledge society, contrasting it with the industrial societies or the agricultural societies of the past. In this new era, the predominant source of influence will stem from information, intelligence, and insight, rather than physical power or natural resources. This knowledge society will confront people everywhere with new challenges and new opportunities. Now, some of us, some of us might be wondering, does this purpose and these attributes match what the rest of the world thinks about knowledge society? According to the definition outlined by the United Nations, knowledge societies have capabilities to identify, produce, process, transform, disseminate, and use information to build and apply knowledge for human development. This definition matches exactly what our beloved prophets and imams have taught for centuries. What underwrites the ability to contribute to the knowledge society? As your mom has said at Craig's Republic, and I quote, there is no better investment that individuals, parents, and the nation can make than investment in education of the highest possible quality, unquote. Quotation is from speech in Craig's Republic in 2002. Education of the highest possible quality can benefit, benefit us in so many ways. It allows us to acquire the newest knowledge. It provides students with a competitive advantage within global societies. It prepares us for leadership in the knowledge society. It provides the fundamental skills that will allow us to participate in fields of the future and to transition between careers. Therefore, I would like to encourage the students of Arjama to aim for education of the highest possible quality as there is no better investment than education. Lastly, I would like to thank the students and the Jamaat who have attended the series. These events would not have been successful without your participation and support. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the team and partners for all of their hard work in organizing these events. Now, I'd like to hand it off to Shaino to introduce our speaker for this afternoon. Thank you so much, Danish. And now that we have an introductory understanding of some of the relevant concepts, let's meet our speaker for today. Rahim Bojani is an engineering leader at Tableau Software with over 15 years of experience in building and shipping team and enterprise software. At Tableau, Rahim leads efforts around data security, sharing and governance. His team most recently developed and launched Tableau Prep, a standalone tool to help users manage and transform their data into usable models. Rahim is based out of Austin and was one of the original members of the dev team in that office. And since 2015, the Austin Development Office has grown to close to 30 engineers. Rahim also oversees teams based out of Austin, Seattle, Palo Alto, and Vancouver, Canada. Prior to Tableau, Rahim worked at Microsoft for eight years, 
focused on .NET compilers and Azure, the cloud platform. He is passionate about the mission of Tableau, helping people see and understand their data and enabling end users to build a richer data structure. Outside of his professional life, Rahim enjoys community-based volunteer engagement and mentorship. He believes his success is attributable to the people that took the time to mentor him. As such, he is always able, he is always open to engaging in opportunities to give back and pay it forward. And before we begin, I'd like to encourage our audience to ask questions throughout the session. You can do that by using the Q&A feature of Zoom and entering your question there. The upvote feature is enabled, so if you have the same question as someone else, someone else, please like it, and it will rise to the top of the Q&A box. Our team will be noting the questions to be asked during the Q&A session towards the end of today's session. And now, I'd also like to inform the Jamaat that the recording of the session, along with the presentation, will be shared on our website, fieldsofthefuture.com. So now, without further ado, our speaker, Rahim Bojani, will speak to us about his career path, new opportunities within the field, and how the field will evolve in the future. With that, I'd like to hand it off to Rahim. Thank you, Shano, for the great introduction. Yalima did everybody. Thank you for having me here. And uh, let's get straight into it. So we'll start with this is a quick agenda. We'll talk a little bit about my journey. Um, we'll get into a little bit of the science behind data visualization, some of the opportunities in this field, and end with some of the challenges. So I grew up and did my high schooling in Pakistan, and uh, and I and then I moved to North America to complete my uh, higher education. Um, and, you know, as some of you may know, international students have challenges um, when it comes to getting into college. And so I'd gotten into a couple of top tier schools in the U.S., but I didn't really have the money to go there. So I ended up going to a small school in northern British Columbia. The reason I mentioned that is I believe it was very pivotal for me um, for where I am today. Going to a small school enabled a little bit more sort of time with my professors. So originally, I ended up, I was going there to study economics. But one of my professors basically suggested that I should switch and uh, study computer science. And so I went to talk to the dean of computer science and took an intro class and I was hooked. So I graduated with a bachelor of science in computer science. And I also managed to put in about 20 months of internships. And the internship was the second pivotal moment for me because they allowed, they, they allowed three things. One, it built my own confidence that I can do this. Two, it was a massive resume builder. Like after that first internship, it was a snowball effect leading into my first full-time job. And three, I was able to make enough money to pay for most of my education. After I graduated, I moved to Seattle where um, some of my family lived and I started at Microsoft. Um, my career at Microsoft, I like to think of as my real world education. This is where I learned how to be a professional. Uh, I learned what it means to be relied upon both by teammates and customers. One of the key takeaways that my mentors taught me was how to ask for help, you know, oftentimes um, we think asking for, at least I used to think asking for help it was a sign of weakness. But in a professional environment, asking for help is the opposite. Right? It unblocks you, it engages your teammates. And uh, that was one of the key take takeaways. So I, I, from there, uh, I worked on many different technologies, ending up in the Azure team, which is the cloud platform. And then from, I spent eight years there and towards the end of my tenure, uh, an interesting thing happened. I was working on the, the uh, I was working on analyzing some data out of our Azure data centers. And I was trying to build a three axis chart in Excel. And I was having a really difficult time with it. So one of my coworkers suggested that I download Tableau and give it a try. So I downloaded Tableau, I set myself up for a two week trial or something that was take, had taken me three weeks, I was able to do in two hours. And it blew my mind. I was like, how did they build this software? I wanna learn about it. Now call it fake, call it karma. The very next week, the guy that hired me at Microsoft eight years ago, 
reached out and said, hey, I've joined this a small startup in Seattle called Tableau, it's 200 people, do you want to join? And the rest they say is history. So I've been here now, eight, this is my eighth year. Uh, we were acquired by Salesforce in 2019. And as uh, Shano said in my intro, I lead a new incubation team around data governance and security. So this is a little bit about me and let's get straight into uh, the science of data visualization. So this part of the presentation is adapted, is adapted from introductions that we do at Tableau for prospective customers and for new customers uh, around an introduction to the space. The science is adapted from the research of our founder, Dr. Stolte. His thesis at Stanford turned into what Tableau is today. Dr. Stolte or Chris Stolte is like, he's like the Steve Jobs of this industry. He could see where the customer was going before they themselves knew and pioneered the self-service analytics market. So before we do a deep dive into the science, I would like to do a warming up exercise. In a second, you will see some data. And the exercise is for you to count the sevens. Please uh, enter what you see in, in the chat box and we'll give everybody 30 seconds uh, to do that. So let's get started. All right, like Raheem mentioned, the, the chat box is enabled. So submit your, uh, submit the, your answer there. All right, so we're already getting answers. We have uh, Aman saying eight, Elnor is saying nine, Faisal said 10, Zorin said 10, Simran said 10, Azim said nine, Noman said 10, Shiraz said 10, Tofik said five, uh, Sam said 10, Saifa said nine, Rifa said 10. Uh, Perfect. Said 10. Perfect, so that, that was the point. You could see the sort of variety of responses, right? Now, um, how about, how about we try this again now? Well, I'll give you 10 seconds now. We've got nine, 10, 10, Mon says 10, Sultan says 10, Raheem says nine. Uh, how about Shana now? Says 10, and Shamshuddin says 11. All right. So the, the, what I was hoping to illustrate with this exercise is the way in which your brain is naturally prepared to identify and process different types of visual patterns. But becoming conscious of this fact, how our brains identify visual patterns, we can use it to our advantage to make our charts and dashboards more powerful. This is the whole basis of visual analytics. So in this example, if you notice, as we went from completely uniform data to, to this last slide, uh, you, you could probably identify that there are 10 sevens a lot quicker, right? And so hold on to this concept. And so we'll go through this more and more. So what is what actually is visual analytics? Quoting from one of the experts in this subject, visual analytics is the representation and the presentation of data that exploits our visual perception abilities in order to amplify cognition. What does this mean? It means leveraging the way our brain interprets and processes visual inputs to maximize our ability to understand and mostly just to make sense of information. This might feel you know, really abstract, but we'll get into a few examples here. Take this, uh, some uh, a basic cross tab. I'm sure most of you have seen this. It gives us a lot of information and is suitable if we need to look up specific values. Now imagine you're the head of sales for the customer segment, and I want and I want to know which subcategory has the largest profitability problem. You could probably grind it out. You would figure it out, but it will take you some time. Just like the first seven slide, right? But what if we represented this a little bit better? I'm taking the same table and all I've done is I've used color to differentiate positive from negative profits. This is a visual cue and we'll talk about visual cues a little bit more. 
it's a little less work to find the subcategory with the biggest profitability issues, but I might still need to do some math and rely on my memory. And imagine if there were more rows with more negative profitability issues. In short, this version is a little bit better, but how about this one? It's the same report, but in addition to colors, red for negative profitability, gray for small positive and black for more positive, I've also added bars. And with the bars comes the orientation of the bars. So I don't need to look at the small font on the numbers. I can just visually see um, outliers. Clearly it's the subcategory of tables that has the largest uh, profitability issues. And this is just a small example of the things you can adapt in your own presentation so that your point comes across a lot quicker. Okay. So let's get into the science for a bit. What we do in effect, in an effective visual is for people to use what we call the visual cortex. That's the part of the brain that allows you to quickly see things. Now, there, of course, there's always time and place for the cerebral cortex for deeper thinking. But remember, we want people to look at a visual in an instant and understand what it is about. It is about deep thinking. So let's think about how we can exploit that. Of, of course, there's always time for deep thinking, but that's usually slow and inefficient. On the other hand, we see almost immediately uh, what we can detect in patterns. If we can put data into a form our visual system can make sense of, we can exploit that power. These are some examples of things you can use for visuals. These are called pre-attentive attributes. These are basically brain hacks. Before we really pay attention, these are the things that stand out, whether it's size, color, orientation, or length. Now we'll, 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 we'll talk about this in the, in the how humans perceive data section, that some of these are more important than others. But, 70, but the key thing here is to note that 70% of information we get through our eyes. So let's leverage it. Now that we have been introduced to pre-attentive pre attributes, let's turn to another part of the science of data visualization to help us understand more how our brains can help or hinder our understanding of data. This element is called memory limits. Here's an example. Suppose I gave you this data and ask you a couple questions. If I ask you whether we gained or lost customers in the last four years, we can easily answer the question because we have the total of the slide. But I ask, if I ask you how each of our locations compare, well, that's a little tricky. But if the same data, I took the same data and I showed you visually in a chart, we can easily make that comparison. Austin stands out. Why is that? That this is so much more effective. The science shows that the human brain can really only hold about six numbers in our register. When I gave you that table, excluding the, the totals line, it's 16 values, a lot more than six. But now when, when I showed you the chart, I chucked each of those rows in one line and linked it with a color. Now you can easily differentiate between those patterns. Memory limits do not only apply to numbers, but also to views. One of the key concepts at Tableau when we develop software is to keep people within the flow of analysis. What that means is interruptions slow people down. In the data visualization realm, we might force people to jump back and forth between tools or browsers or even research material, but that's very, very inefficient. To prove this point of how harmful that can be, let's take a look at this picture. I'm going to introduce an interruption and then make a change to the picture. See if you can notice the change, right? So this is the original picture. Let's do an, inter an interruption for five seconds. And here's a picture with the change. Do you guys see the change? Let's try this again. Original picture, interruption, and same picture, but with a change. So if you noticed that these leaves are missing, you're one of the rare few, because most of us 
would miss that detail. And so this is the key thing. When you're doing analysis, you want to use tools that let you stay within the flow of analysis, that you don't have to context switch. And secondly, you want to know, you want to be an expert in those tools so you don't have to go research how to use them, right? So how do we overcome some of these concepts of memory limits? Here's some. Here's a, a few uh, examples of how you how you could make things better. Right? Use familiar chart types. Don't force your audience to learn how to use a new chart. Don't make people remember views. Show information simultaneously when possible. Avoid large legends with many values because again, that requires people to remember. And then use intuitive colors and shapes. So in this section, we've seen that our brain quickly detects patterns and visuals using the pre-attentive attributes and that we should aim to overcome memory limits to make and enhance our brain to quickly gather the information. Now we'll go into uh, the second section, which is how do humans like their data? Uh, this, is, this is a very large space and we're gonna just do a brief introduction today, but there's a lot more to it than what we're going to see today. So before we get into it, let's just start with uh, some basic recaps uh, from high school. Some of, some of the attendees might know this already, but, but we'll do a quick recap. There are three key types of data. Qualitative, there is no clear order to the data and they don't have a clear relationship to each other. They don't contain numbers. Uh, and then quali qualitative nominal and qualitative ordinal. They have a relation to each other, but they can't measure the distance between them, but you understand how they compare in relationship to each other. And then there's quantitative, which is these data are numbers, you can do math with them and you know exactly what the difference is between them. And how do you visualize it? Knowing the data type makes it easier to find the right visualizations. Basically the type of data you have impacts the way you can visually represent. And here's a, here's a, here's a, a basic, sort of uh, understanding the industry of how to position such data. Now, remember earlier I mentioned some of the pre-attentive attributes were more important than others. Well, here's a hierarchy of that importance. Based on research, position is the best across all three types of data because humans view position as the most important shape and shape as the least important. This hierarchy kind of makes sense, right? Imagine how difficult it would be if all the stop signs changed to yellow and, and all the giveaway signs changed to red, even if they were in the same shape. It's the color we look at first, right? So this brings to an end uh, sort of some of the science portion of this presentation. Next, let's switch gears and we'll talk about some of the opportunities in the space. So this chart, um, is, uh, is, uh, is in the most recent report from IDC and Seagate, uh, the hard drive bill. This shows the proliferation of data in, in everywhere. The data is generated in every field from CRM to ERP, to sensors, to appliances, to apps, to websites, et cetera, et cetera. The, the, you may wonder what a zettabyte is. I have to look it up. It's one billion, one terabyte hard drives, or in other words, a trillion gigabytes. In 2017, the economist published a story titled The World's Most Valuable Resource is No Longer Oil by this data. So this is why you know, there's so much importance in this industry and field today. Um, I, I list out about eight sort of uh, roles uh, that that um, can take advantage, that you can take advantage of. It, be, you know, it doesn't matter if you're uh, in high school, college, a new grad, or somebody looking to change profession, right? I just wanna give you an overview. It, it's not restricted to just these eight rules, but I just wanna give you overview of the type of positions available and what they do. So to start with data consumers and leaders, you know, I've listed some of the tools that they use, and some of the example job titles like chief marketing officer, human resource head, head of sales. These people are consumers. They usually take output somebody else has produced to make decisions. 
And then there's business analysts. These guys are subject matter experts. Um, they again use spreadsheets and Excel, Power BI, et cetera. Then there's data analysts. They're a little bit more technical. They use programming languages and are familiar with database concepts. And then there's data scientists. These guys do deeper kind of uh, analysis of the data. They do more what if, predictive, uh, future looking uh, analysis. Uh, then there's machine learning scientists. This requires some sort of formal training in math and statistics. They use industry standard tools like Spark and Airflow. Um, you know, and that's it. And, and machine learning roles are one of the hottest growing sort of segments in the industry. You know, the, the, these guys make a lot of money and they're very, uh, very rare these days. It's very hard to hire them. And then there's you know st your standard statisticians, programmers, and data engineers. Data engineers is interesting. It's really evolving now because as data proliferates, you need people who can set your organization up for the future. So you need more. Uh, you need people, data engineers to architect where you're going to store information, how you're going to relate it, etc. So one of the key, uh, I, I want to summarize some of the skills in these roles. So. One of the most basic things that you could do to study is SQL. Um, is the language a database is conceptually understanding it is a must. If you can understand how data is stored and related, you'll be, you'll be a step above others. Microsoft Excel, fortunately or unfortunately, is still the most prevalent analytical tool in the world. You know, you, you could get started with it really quickly, uh, especially if you're a domain expert. You could load your data in a spreadsheet and do, uh, you know, you could use VBA to do advanced scripting. You could do pivoting aggregations right there in Excel. R and Python are, are the de facto standard for the aspiring data scientists. It's very powerful open source libraries for data cleaning and predictive analytics. And the communities around those is huge. You, you can find a lot of help online. You could ask questions. There's a lot of samples if you want to just get started in space. Data visualization is sort of, is kind of new, is pioneered in the last about decade or so. Schools are now offering courses in it, right? Because telling stories with data is very critical. Uh, Tableau, Power BI, Click are some examples of tools that provide these visualization, visualization uh, capabilities. And like I said, they're becoming very standard in the industry. And then finally, it's the, um, machine learning and AI and predictive analytics. This is the fastest growing area in the domain. And it's not just, it's not just important to understand the tooling behind this, right? The math behind it, but how it's applied is also very important. Which industry it's applied in, how it's applied in. Uh, and there's a lot of growth to be seen there. And then, in this slide, what I wanted to communicate with all those, I picked these three roles, but with all those roles that we talked about, the eight, they're really all just different sides of the same coin. So if you look at the data analyst, like this person tends to serve as the gatekeeper for an organization. You know, they understand where the data is coming from, how it's stored. Um, it's typically a technical role, requires some kind of in undergraduate degree in uh, math, statistics, or computer science. Then you have sort of the business analyst. This is more of a strategic role. Uh, these people are, tend to be the subject matter experts, right? They're the financial analysts. They're the supply chain folks. Right? They, they typically under, uh, have a degree in business administration, economics, or finance, right? These guys are the ones that make sense of the information, of the data itself. These guys are the ones that actually say, Here's what this means. Here's what the decisions we want to make, and so on. And then finally, you know, we have the data scientists. Right? They take data created by the analysts a step further, sifting through to identify weaknesses, trends, opportunities. This role requires some background in math or computer science, and sometimes also study or insight into human behavior. So when you talk about you know, preferences of our people, like you need to understand some human behavior. 
Now the one kind of role I didn't, I left out, but I've encountered over the last eight years uh, as I've in my role is what we call citizen data scientists. These folks are sort of the, the people in an organization who are embedded and they're not formally trained, but they've taught themselves. And the reason they're called citizen data scientists is because they know their space, their domain really well. And then they've enhanced their own skill set by teaching themselves and a kind of becoming that go-to person where then everybody looks towards to teach, to, um, to move the organization forward. So you don't, while formal education is good, you don't have to do that. The key thing is you can learn and pick up your tools along the way. You just have to know what you want to do. Right? You have to know what your data is. You have to be an expert in your own field. That's key. And then finally, I'll leave you with, um, Gartner published these, these key trends this year. Um, and as you can see, there's a lot of focus on automation and AI. Now, I, I encounter a lot of customers in, in my role and I think we're still a ways away from predictions and uh, automatic data analysis because people don't trust the information because they don't understand how those predictions are, are made. But, but this is where we're going, right? Because again, this is just another tool that helps people get to where they need to be. All right, so this is the opportunity section. And now we'll move forward and we'll talk about some challenges in this space. So, you know, to me, challenges just kind of come down to two main things, trust and ethics. Um, you know, we've heard, you know, enough examples where there's been data breaches and people's information has leaked out, you know. And so as we, as you guys, you know, transition into the space or are entering into the space, just remember privacy is in depth. Uh, we have to make sure we provide the right tooling and have the right sort of architecture so that private data, you know, doesn't leak uh, or it's not misused. And just remember private data does not equal secret, right? It's, 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 it's still going to get used. Um, then there's a second concept of shared sensitive information, which is you consent to sharing information like financial, medical, and other sensitive information like location. But third party companies can purchase that information. So we have to have rules on how this information should be used and shared. And then big data should require transparency. Right? We should know, customers should know on what is being collected and how it's being used. And, and then finally, big data has some un, could have unfair biases like racism and sexism, it's implicit or in some cases explicit biases in AI algorithms and training data. And with that, I'll transition into an example of that. Um, this is this is a blog from Khan Academy, and this is a researcher who literally had to wear a white mask for the facial recognition software to recognize. Now in this case, most of the training data used was uh, used was white males, and most of the people developing the algorithms were also white males. So it's understandable that they test this on themselves, and so use this instance as a call to action. So, because this is very explicit bias. Imagine these algorithms are used for day-to-day uh, -day things like you know getting into your house or at at banks for security for identifying because that's where we're going. Uh, in the same blog, there's another study that was published from the National Institute of Science. Uh, it tried out 189 facial recognition algorithms with 18.27 million images and measured how often the algorithm recognized that the two faces were of the same person. They found false positive were up to 100 times more likely for East Asian and African Americans' faces when compared to white faces. Again, this talks about, um, you know, deep, deep, like we need, as we learn and enter in this space, we need to have deeper thinking on how we develop and train these systems. 
And then finally, I'll leave you with this. Um, over the last eight years, this, this pattern I've seen again and again and again. For, for people who are interested in learning about data visualization and data science, I would suggest pick up, you know, pick up something, some data set that you're very interested in and then start, you know, start analyzing, start using the tools. Because if it's a domain that you're interested in, I guarantee you, you won't be intimidated by it. You'll start enjoying it. You know, the human mind is capable of processing large volumes of data quickly. And we just need to present it the right way, right? And this is just the analysis part. Imagine what it enables downstream. Like if we shed more light into decisions with data rather than instinct and intuition, imagine what else we can do. So this brings um, me to the end of my presentation. I'll leave uh, a couple of links here uh, on how to reach me. And Shano, we can uh, transition to uh, Q&A. Awesome, Raheem, thank you so much for sharing your field with us today. I, I really enjoyed hearing about all the different opportunities, You know, the eight kind of roles you mentioned, that's not even an exhaustive list. Um, and so, you know, with that, I'd open the floor to questions. Like I mentioned earlier, you can uh, continue to ask questions in the Q&A feature and make sure to use the upvote function um, if, you, if you have the same question as someone else. And so, Raheem, uh, I know you mentioned kind of your journey into uh, this field with, you know, you were first at Microsoft and you shared the story about how you used Tableau uh, for the first time. But I think what kind of uh, skills did your, your educational foundation and then your work at Microsoft give you that helped you transition into um, this, this work at Tableau? Yeah, so I, I think um, in my, um, when, I, when I talk to new hires or interns, I think that the thing that I tell them is a computer science degree, the main thing in my mind that, teach, that, that it teaches you is the how to break problems down. Um, and so, the, our, our key sort of responsibility is to take abstract things and boil it down into things that you can build them back up, right? That, so that's my, that's my educational training. At Microsoft, um, the, the, you know, I, I came in with not understanding how to work uh, in a corporation, what it means to be on time, how to, you know, how to work hard. And I was lucky with my mentors along the way that, that, that taught me how, what that means. It, you know that, and I built confidence that way that I could be successful. Uh, and then at Tableau, uh, it literally is the passion of our founders because it was a founder-led, mission-led company, right? We wanted; they believe uh, Tableau would be for data, what Google was for search. That's why they built the company the way it was. And that passion, I was lucky enough to see, it, uh, which, which, which. Uh, made me want to work harder, made me want to aspire to be like my leaders, right? But the main thing at Tableau that really uh, catapulted me was I could visibly see that I, the work I did made a difference to others. The very first Tableau conference I attended, uh, this lady came up and gave me a hug because of a feature that I built and it helped her do her job better. Right? So that validation that you know, you're doing something that helps others, uh, you know, it helps you. So. That's awesome. I, I think that's such a cool story. Um, and I think the hottest question right now in, in the in the chat right now is, are, do you have any free tools or any kind of softwares that people who maybe have an educational background or in a nonprofit space uh, who don't have the funds to get a, a premium tool can, can explore and, and get started in this field? Yeah, so for, for Tableau uh, has uh, it's free for students or anybody with a edu email account. We also have a free sharing sharing platform, which is actually used a lot by journalists called Tableau Public. And so, if you want to just go look at examples of what people are producing, you can just go on Tableau Public. I believe Power BI has something similar too. Um, and these are the two premier kind of tools in the industry, right? Uh, you can't go wrong with both of them. Uh, if you want to go more um, uh, technical and you want to uh, try things out on your own, um, there's a lot of uh, visualization libraries like D3 that you can go learn. 
uh, it requires a little bit more, uh, uh, you know, uh, formal training, right? I think. Um, and then there's statistical tools uh, uh, with R and Python. The statistical statistical libraries there in R and Python where you can we can pick up as well. So you mentioned Microsoft BI and Tableau Public, um, and then also yeah, so Tableau Educational Tier. Correct. The Tableau for sure has a ED, free offering for ED, anybody with an EDU account. Uh, you can look it up on. In fact, what I'll do is I'll dig up the links and I'll, you can you guys could share it uh, as, as part mm -hmm. of this. Um, and then I'm sure Power BI does too. Awesome. Um, and so, you know, now that people have the resources to explore this field, um, you know, if, if they aren't exactly in the technology field, if they don't have a background in, say, computer science, can they still transition into um, the data visualization, the, the, the data field, and still succeed in Excel? Yes. Um, as I said, uh, you know, in the eight years that I've been here, I've seen this time and time again with the customers that I work with. Um, there's, pe like, there's people from uh, doctors to marketing folks to salespeople uh, to people who are financial analysts, right, who know nothing about programming. They picked up tools like Tableau and Power BI or even Excel. The key thing is they know their domain. They know their data. They know what type of questions you want to ask. So you can always start that way. Now, as we talked today, there is some science behind how you prepare the data visualizations, right? And that's the part you study. Some of it you can do it by trial and error. error. Some of it you can just pick up the tools that are available in the market like Tableau and click in Power BI and learn them. Um, so you can totally do this. Uh, I, I have uh, this one person, Kate, uh, in Boston. She was an analyst at Comcast. And now she's a director and all she did was learn how to present this information that she knew, right? Uh, in a way that was consumable, which was very well received by her. her and now she's the head of the BI department. And it took her three years. So there's so many examples of this that I've seen in my own career that, that you can do. There's no limitation. That's awesome. And, and having that, that knowledge of another field of, of understanding what the data means, not just understanding the data is also an addition, right? Correct. Correct. It's the value add, right? Like the, the tooling is just the tooling. What you do with it is what is, is key. And yeah. in my experience, it's, it's people who know their domain. They're the ones that are the most successful because they know their data. They know what they want to communicate and then iterate. Okay. Um, and I think, you know, as people want to build this kind of not, not necessarily understanding what the data means, but understanding the tools and, and technicalities, do you have any courses that you would recommend? Uh, I think there's a, uh, I haven't looked online specifically, but um, as I was doing research for this uh, presentation, Northeastern uh, University has a bunch of uh, core, uh, certifications. UT Austin has a bunch of certifications. I'm, in, in my view, you can't go wrong because the foundation of all those things is very similar. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you when you take these certifications, the added flavor that you get is is the person teaching them because they bring their own view from whatever industry they're coming. With. So yeah, you can't go wrong with, with 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 taking those type of things. And then of course, there's the Coursera's of the world. They they have a whole bunch of stuff on there, both going from just learning raw R and Python and statistics and math to actually data visualization. What's the best What's the best practices, etc. Mm -hmm. And and kind of closing out this. A career transition discussion. Um, if I do complete a course on Coursera or any other of these platforms that you mentioned, are they recognized by institutions like Microsoft and Tableau? Uh, it, I, I think it's less important to be recognized by Tableau and Microsoft because they're tool vendors. It's more important to look at uh, what industry are you in, right? And how does that benefit that industry? What company do you work for? Now, if you want to work at Microsoft or Tableau as a data scientist, that's different, right? That's a different domain. So the certification is just a stepping stone. Then you have to learn the domain. You have to say, okay, I want to be a data scientist. So we have data scientists who analyze how people use our software. So what does that mean? You know, like how, how do you get experience there? So again, it, 
the certification itself is a stepping stone. What domain you apply it to is what you bring to the table. Okay. And that's what that, that's what's more important. Um, and in terms of to directly answer the question, I don't know. I don't know how, uh, I, I don't think companies would blanketly say blast certification or blah education. All I can tell you nowadays, you know, there is a tendency to overlook formal education. Like, no, you know, a lot of companies are doing away with the four year, five year college degree requirement. And so these courses, these online kind of uh, boot camps and specific courses do have value. For sure. And I think that that's an important point that it's, it's a stepping stone. It helps you build that foundational knowledge. Correct. Um, and this is more of a technical question now, shifting gears. Uh, how do machines learn via deep learning with, with weight applications is, is still not fully understood. Do you have any data visualization tools that are being developed to better understand how machine learning works? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I, I think, and again, I'm not an expert in, in uh, deep learning and machine learning, um, but the there's just a the nature of how, uh, just the nature of how the training works, right? Because it's dependent on what you train the the algorithm with. It, it's 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 um it's opaque to the end user. So the, the then the then it and then and then it takes time, right? It's hours and hours and days and days of training. So how do you communicate that? So uh, I can't directly answer that question. I don't. Uh, I don't have a good answer, but I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, we we built an AI. In, we were testing an AI assistant in our in our software, and we had uh, restricted it to uh, just some specific statistical analysis, like mean and median. And so, while you were looking, let's say you were looking at housing prices, this thing would pop up and say, "Hey, in this location, here's the mean, here's the average, here's the median," and what we notice is 80% of the time people would just ignore it because they didn't really understand how the thing calculated, right? Instead, what we pivoted to was we would say, hey, we have some predictive tools. Would you like to use them? And so instead of giving them the result, we gave them the tool, we gave the user the tools. Right. And so so that's in my view, that's where the industry is. Like we, we need to give people the tools so they can figure out how to use them instead of just giving them the answer. Now, is there is there, you know, uh, Salesforce has this uh, product called Einstein Analytics, and it's, it's huge with predictions, especially within the CRM workflow. Right. So it just depends on context. So I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, I mean, that that's that's what I think. I think that, that's a really, really good insight into that. Um, and, you know, you, one thing you mentioned is how, how things are, are continually building and how new tools are being developed. Um, and so I have a question for you is that in your day-to-day -day life uh, or in your day-to-day -day work, um, do you, with, with kind of the evolving tools, the new methodologies, how do you stay abreast of all of this? Um, so I... You know, I uh, nowadays, right? My job really is is very different. Uh, I, I build people instead of I bu building software. Right? That that's a transition I made a few years ago. Um, but I made a promise to myself that in a technical company, I'll try and be as technical as possible. That I learned from my founder. Right? He used to read five textbooks a week, research books a week, and then he would give one to each of his directs. And then that's how they would come up with new concepts and ideas. And so I try to do, I try to incorporate a little of that in my day. So I, I, every morning from eight, uh, from about seven to 10 a.m., I block off my calendar. Uh, and I spend that time reading specs, uh, reading research papers, blogs, uh, and just trying out new features in our own software. What that allows me to do is, is it, it, it keeps me in touch with what's happening with the team. And that makes me happy. And then my day, normal day starts. And, and so that's, you know, it, it takes extra effort, uh, but, but that makes me happy. And so I do it. And so that's kind of just, you have to be very deliberate about that. And so I consume information from whatever sources, from books, from blogs, from online um, sites, and also by just trying out my uh, software myself.
Do you have any specific resources or, or personal favorites that you'd like to share? Um, no, like I, I, you know, I subscribe to Wired, right? So that that's, they have a bunch of new trends. And then there's um, mostly like work stuff. So there's Gartner. Um, then there's, uh, I, I, I subscribe to Stanford's blogs because uh, that's where the founder of the company was. So there's a lot of research that comes out of that. Um, and then mostly it's all internal, right? So it's specifications for new things we're doing, research that we've done, user studies that we've done. And so that I have available to me at work. And so I consume that information. Okay. Um, and one of the, well, another common question we have in the, in the Q and A box is, um, what is the role of a, a master's degree um, in this field and, and how, how does it give you an upper advantage in this field? I mean, it just gives you further specialization and more domain, right? Um, if, if you, if you, if you, if you take, uh, uh, if you take the example of, um, uh, if you take a craftsman analogy, you take a carpenter, you know, the first few years you're an apprentice, so you equate that to a bachelor's degree, and then you graduate and you become a journeyman. You equate that to a master's degree, and then you become a master craftsman, and you become, and that's a PhD degree. And Dr. Stoltis, uh, professor at Stanford, Pat Henrahan, who was also one of the founders of Tableau, he used to do, um, when we got hired, right, he would use these onboarding uh, trainings. And in the trainings, he would say, the difference between those levels is the tools that you use, is the education you have, is the experience you have. And I believe that, I believe that to be true. So the master's degree really is it's further deepening your understanding about a domain, learning the tools, whatever they may be, learning how to do research, learning how to communicate that. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my view. And I think it's applicable to any industry. It doesn't have to be computers. Okay. Um, and I think that's an important point about how it, it adds you, it, it pushes you to the next level. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let's say that I'm all the way at the bottom, I've never kind of set foot into the data science field. How can you obtain that domain experience? Yeah, I think just uh, going back to my very last slide, pick up what I did with Tableau, why I got hooked is because I was struggling with a problem that was my problem, right? Like I, I knew that space, I was motivated to solve it. And that's how I got hooked. And I've seen that time and time again in my eight years here where customers get the tools, get Tableau or whatever tools they're using, and they're doing it on the data set or some challenge that they want to solve versus something superficial. And that's the difference, right? If you do it on superficial data, you're like, ah, it's nice, whatever. If you do it for the thing that you are struggling with or you want to solve, then you'll get hooked. And that's how you just get started that way. I really like that about just, you know, sandboxing it and then that's what gets you hooked. Yeah. Um, now, I think I, I'll pick up on something we mentioned earlier, and that's data governance. So um, could, could you expand a little bit more on your experience with that and kind of what metrics and, and tools are used to, to measure data governance? So um, as my founders have pioneered the self-service uh, industry, analytics industry, and I'll draw the contrast. Um, before sort of Tableau became the standard, you used to have IT or uh, some department that would do the analysis, that would do the reporting. And then the reports would go to the analyst and analyst say, oh, but I have one more question. And so you used to have this circle, you had the back, back and forth. With Tableau, one of the core things that we introduced now that everybody else is doing is the analyst should be asking the questions directly and there should be no technical limitation. They should be able to do the analysis. Now, what's, what, what that has caused in the industry in a corporation is this proliferation of analysis proliferation of data. Now this becomes a problem for sort of the CISOs, the chief security officers, the head of IT, the head of data, because how do they know that decisions are being made on the right data, that there's no mistakes being made? So this is where governance is very important, right? Uh, so there's concepts of certification. So you have some expert like a data architect who comes in and says, I certify this data. I know it's legit, it's coming from a legit source. The calculations I validated, so you can now go use this for uh, your analysis. 
So that's just one kind of concept um, that we're formalizing in terms of building software. Another big concept is lineage. So channel, let's say you did some analysis that's built on my analysis and then Zora does the analysis or build on your analysis. So somebody consumes her analysis. Now it's three steps removed from the original one. So, and that's okay, there's nothing wrong with it. But if you have that lineage, right? You know where this came from and you trust, trust all those stopping points along the way, you have that much more confidence in what it is you're doing. So those are some key things that I'm working on nowadays on how you formalize that with the software that we built. So people have confidence in the end result. And I guess a follow up on that data governance is with is not is it with just the analysis that comes from the data or is it also the the data itself? It's it, it, at the end of the day, it's the data itself, right? So the uh, analysis is just the endpoint. You want to be able to trace all the way back to where it came from, who authored it, who blessed it. Do you should you even have access to it? Like we have use cases where you go to, into a hospital. A doctor can see all the information, and let's say you know if you take it in the in the concept of the data, so it's in tables. You have rows and columns, so a doctor can see all the columns because it's their patient. The receptionist can only see the contact information, which is a couple of the columns. The nurse can only see the the patient that she or he she or he is serving. So only some of the rows, right? So these are all sort of rules we can build into the software that somebody can configure and then say, okay, I certify this is good. Now you can go use it. Okay. Um, and so, sorry, I was gathering my thoughts and I think that uh, we'll move on to the next question. And the next sure. question is, uh, is discussing kind of the, the comparison between Power BI and Tableau. Um, and, and, you know, what are the key differences and how do they differ uh, in terms of demand of employment? Yeah, it's to see, I'm very biased, you know, I, I joined Tableau as 200 people and uh, grew, you know, the company is, is went through hyper growth and it got sold uh, to Salesforce. So uh, I, I also, you know, it was a mission led, founder led company. And like I said, our founder was, a, you know, I've never uh, met somebody like that in my life, right? Um, so I think my best advice is there's a lot of material online for comparison, uh, best thing I can tell you is to try it out. Try it out for the applications that you're interested in and make your own assessment. I'll leave you with a base sort of assertion. Uh, Tableau pioneered this space and it's actually more intuitive um, in terms of um, using and, uh, uh, and, and, and it spans across, like we're the switzer in the data. We don't care where the data comes from, right? We'll, you can use us with, any platform you want. Microsoft uh, Power BI, on the other hand, is integrated into their staff. So SQL Server and Azure Cloud Platform, et cetera. And, and that integration all is, so for example, if you've already, if you're working in a company that's a Microsoft shop, you probably already have Power BI. You probably already uh, are certified in Microsoft technologies. So it's easier for you to get started. There's no wrong answer, right? The, the key thing as I repeated earlier is get started. Go use the tools, make your form your own opinion. So, uh, you know, uh, I'm biased. I think Tableau is better, but I've been here so long. So, I think that's it's fair to be biased. But I think um, since you have so much insight in Tableau, and since you've been there for for so long, we, we'd like to get a little bit deeper into into you know how it works. And I think we have a question about. Um, does Tableau adapt to different fields or domains, or is it kind of one product that is is universally? Um, yes. Universally? Yeah. So we 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 are um, we're a blank palette. I right? think of it as drawing uh, on a blank canvas. We don't care what industry or what domain uh, you use it in. In fact, we have uh, uh, customers from you know a doctor. Uh, running his own practice, uh, using Tableau to calculate wait times, queue times, because that's one of the things they have to report for Medicare benefits. And, and that individual doctor doing this himself to Fortune 500 companies, you know, Wells Fargo, JP Morgan Chase, Facebook, Apple, Tesla, 
um, like Tesla's production line used to run on Tableau. They used to do their QA. Uh, now they've decided to build their own software that's because that's how they do it. But uh, point being, it's, a, it's adaptable to manufacturing, to pharma, to financial, like it doesn't matter um, because we connect to whatever source where the data is stored. And then we model it in a way which is completely abstracted away and is generic. And then you can ask the questions by dragging and dropping. Okay, that, that, that helps me understand the kind of the tool. And I think that, um, you know, you've worked with this tool, you, you've built it, and now you're an, you're an engineering leader. Uh, the question is posed, what's next for you? Uh, what's next for me? Um, so I, one of my mentors at Microsoft taught me, there's three things that generally motivate people. Uh, what do they work on? Who do they work with? And what is the reward? And so every six months, I sit down and I ask myself those three questions and I write down the answers. And what I've learned in the 15 years that I've worked is if I'm generally positive for two of those three things, I'm happy. Yeah, I don't need to make a change. I put my notebook away and I keep doing what I'm doing. If I am only positive for one of those three things, then I'm looking for a different role. If I'm not positive for any of those three things, I'm leaving. I'm going to go do something else at a different company. Um, so at this point in my career, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm leading an incubation project. I'm going to try and build a new business. I'm really happy about that. Uh, but if, if, uh, but, but we're in a different space now. We got acquired by a 50,000 person company. It's, it's, it's a different um, world. And so at some point I will do that analysis because I think um, what I saw at Tableau in the early days, I really enjoyed. And so if something like that comes along my way, I might be interested. I don't know. Right? I'm happy where I am. I'll continue to grow uh, and uh, grow people, grow, grow the business, um, focus on that. Those are like the software part, the domain part I know, right? That, that's my... Uh, bread and butter, but now I'm focused on growing people and growing the business. I see. Uh, and, you know, you, you talked about this transition from, you know, growing the software, building the software, and now you build people. Could you expand on kind of that transition and then also what your role entails today? Yeah. So, um, you know, as we went through hyper growth, you know, uh, there's a lot of opportunities to grow. And so I became a manager. Um, in like 2014, and then a manager, managers, manager, managers, and now a couple, one more level up. So that takes you away a little bit from technology. So through maybe 2017, 18, I was still trying to fix bugs. Like I was still trying to do something just to keep myself happy and, and on the edge. And then one of my managers came to me and said, look, I'm being a nuisance to the team. I was trying to learn React, uh, which is a UI technology. And I would ask all these basic questions and would annoy some of my devs. And so my manager told me I was being a nuisance that I should stop doing that. And that's the environment I like to build, foster within my team, right? Be honest about how you feel so we can deal with things, right? And so I appreciated that. So uh, I talked to my boss at that time and I said, you know, this is the feedback I got. I don't know how I feel about it. And he said, you have a decision to make. You can't be 50-50. If you're going to grow an organization and be responsible for a lot of people, then you have to be focused on that. And that's where it clicked in my mind where, where my satisfaction was, okay, I wrote this code and I shipped this feature to this person got promoted or I helped um, set individual grow in whatever capacity that they want to grow in technical, uh, or I made a new, or I helped somebody become a leader Right. And so that's what I focus on. I spend a lot of time nowadays doing that, enabling people. Okay. I, I think that that was a really uh, key shift in your career. And I think that um, what helped you transition in that process? Uh, I think given the, given the growth that Tableau was going through and the success that we had, the shift was easy. You know, it's a lot harder when you don't have the opportunities. I'm lucky that I was in the right place, right time where we had the opportunities. And so it didn't feel like I was giving something up. It felt like I was taking on more. Because like I said, I still spend you know, three hours every morning trying to be in touch with the technical parts of, of the company, of the domain. 
but most of my day is focused on on my teens and you know my peers and so when you think of it as a net ad then it's really it's easy to 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 in hindsight it's easy to make that transition okay and so with that um i think we're out of question uh, out of time for questions um is there anything else you'd like to share with with the audience or any kind of last thoughts uh, i think the with the trends of the questions uh, you know about how to get started and what edu what what certifications to to do don't wait right just just pick up uh, pick up something pick up r python pick up the visualization tools or use excel to do your own budget analysis for your own home doesn't matter right see if it grabs your attention because that's key because my belief is if it does you will develop your own skill set over time there's no one there's no one way to do this. Um, and so, yeah, don't, don't hesitate. Uh, just try it out. Okay. I think that's, that's really good advice to just jump right in. Um, and so with that, Raheem, thank you so much for sharing your field of the future with us. And, and thank you for joining us. It was really yep. insightful. Thank um, you for having me. Our pleasure. And, and uh, thank you to the audience for joining us today. Uh, and I want to remind all of you to continue to practice physical distancing and to stay home and save lives. Um, and before I conclude the program, I'd like to request everyone to complete a brief evaluation. Uh, the link will be shared after you end the presentation or in the chat now. Um, and so please complete the evaluation. And with that, uh, thank you all for joining us again. And I hope to see you at our next event in two weeks with Faisal Karmali exploring neuroscience. Thank you, Anyali Madud.